Hey everyone, in this video I will be breaking down Nemesis Reloaded by Mark Miller. Now, I was kind of surprised that Nemesis was getting a second book because I covered the first book, which came out in 2010, and I did not think it was very good. It was Mark Miller at his cringiest and edgiest, he really pushed the envelope a little bit too much for my liking, and it also had a really bad twist ending, that first volume. But in Nemesis Reloaded here, Mark Miller is going to get a second chance because he is rebooting Nemesis. So he is going to try again with this character. The characterization of Nemesis is pretty similar. His origins are a little bit changed around though now. And uh, yeah, and we will see if Mark Miller does a better job the second time. Now I will give a little bit of a tease in that there is a twist ending in a way in the final issue here that I was actually delighted by, unlike the first Nemesis book. So uh, you're definitely going to want to see how this one ends. All right, let's dive into it now. Nemesis Reloaded. Nemesis Reloaded, written by Mark Miller, art by Jorge Jimenez. Before we dive into issue one of this story, here is a little Nemesis background info. Nemesis is like the greatest supervillain in the world. He is like Batman, except if Batman decided to devote his life to being a villain and killing people, instead of devoting his life to stopping crime. Nemesis is someone that devotes their life to being bad and killing good people, and one-upping authorities and showing his superiority to the world. He uses his intelligence and careful planning to beat his enemies. The first volume of Nemesis was written way back in 2010, 13 years ago. Mark Miller now in 2023 has decided to reboot this series. So for those of you who have read the original Nemesis book or watched my video on it, this book, Nemesis Reloaded, is kind of like a redo of Nemesis. It is going to tell Nemesis's origin again, but tweak it. The first Nemesis book was very entertaining, but had tons of problems and bad twists, and there was lots of stuff that was bad in it, so it probably makes sense to actually reboot it. Alright, so let's get into it now. Nemesis Reloaded, Issue 1. A man named Jake hears a noise outside his home. He goes to check it out. Jake, he doesn't find anything outside, though. So he comes back inside his house. And there, he sees his wife, Margot, and she is very scared. The villain, Nemesis, is under her bed with a gun. And he has some plans for Jake and Margot. Later on in Los Angeles, a man named Carlos is leaving a club with a girl on his arm and he gets into his car where his bodyguards will chauffeur him around. Carlos is a badass gangster and the leader of a gang here in Los Angeles. As Carlos is being driven around, Nemesis swoops down from the sky, being flown by some sort of glider device, sort of like a white version of the Green Goblin's glider. Nemesis kicks in the windshield of the car as it is driving, and Nemesis fights his way into the back seat. He grabs Carlos, and then Nemesis breaks through the massive sunroof in the car, going through the glass, and he grabs his glider and takes off into the air with it, along with Carlos. Nemesis, he flies away with Carlos, but what does Nemesis want with Carlos? Well, next we see Carlos is blindfolded, and he is in the middle of a swimming pool with all of its water removed. Blindfolded Carlos is there with at least 50 other people. They are all blindfolded. Nemesis explains the situation to them all, he says. Don't try to remove your blindfolds. They're locked at the back, and you'll detonate my tiny bombs if you fiddle with them. Your only way out of this scenario is to murder everyone around you. These are LA's other gang leaders, so they are going to be quite robust. Now, if you reach inside your pockets, you should find a weapon of some description. Knives, razors, you know, that kind of thing. But I'd get to work fast. If I were you, it shouldn't take long to find the last man standing. 
Carlos and some of the other gang leaders initially resist, but eventually they all start killing each other. They are slashing each other with these knives and razors. We see there is an audience of people watching this battle royale, and they look terrified. The audience is made up of all the LA gang leaders number two, the second in command, and they are all watching their bosses fight to the death. Nemesis explains all to the second in commands. You are all about to receive a significant promotion. I am not muscling into your territory. I have no interest in Los Angeles. I'm only here to gather henchmen for seven days, and you have my word, I'll make it worth your while. There's lean times ahead, with a tough new mayor they just elected, but give me a week and I'll bury him with your old bosses. The LA gang leaders finish their battle royale. Carlos is the only one left standing. He killed all the others. He asks, did I win? Was I the last man standing? Nemesis shoots Carlos and kills him. Nemesis, he then says, yes, Carlos, you're the winner. Then he turns to the crowd of second commands and he says, now let's get you boys into the uniforms I designed. With Nemesis's henchmen now collected, Nemesis begins his plan of terror. Later on, Nemesis drives an all-white motorcycle to match his outfit, you know, to a big art showing at a museum in town, where something called the Melanie Dubois collection is being shown. While Nemesis is driving on over there, he narrates, I've traveled the world honing my cruelties since I was 10 years old learning at the feet of murderers and gang masters and drug lords and despots. Now, I'm back to unleash holy terror on this so-called City of Angels. Twenty years I've been making these plans. In seven days' time, these people will find out why. Nemesis drives his motorcycle up the museum building, which is kind of curved, and then he jumps high into the air, and he comes in through the glass ceiling. He lands in the middle of this museum art show in front of all of these rich people. Nemesis, with his two swords, starts killing the many rich people in attendance. Here, we see him shoving his sword into this guy's mouth. And here, he slices someone in half horizontally. Here, he slices off some people's legs. And there, he slices this guy's head off. As someone tries to run away, Nemesis chucks one of his swords and it goes right through this guy's head, sticking him to the wall as he was trying to get away. On top of all that, Nemesis had an invisible poison gas leak into this crowded museum when he entered the building, so anyone he didn't personally stab with a sword all of a sudden starts begin to suffocate from the gas. Nemesis, he can survive the poison gas though because he had some shots, which made him immune to the gas's effects. He also had his henchmen get the same shots, too. His henchmen start filing into this museum. All of the art and jewels here are supposedly worth $100 million. Nemesis tells them to fill their bags with all the loot they can carry, and then leave their guns on the table where he can reach them in a shootout. One of the reluctant henchman is named Jake. Jake was the man we saw in the beginning of the issue. Jake doesn't understand why Nemesis wants them to just leave their guns on the table. He asks, what are we all supposed to shoot with? Nemesis, kind of laughing, tells him, you think you were here for backup, Jake? <laughs> you guys were just carrying my extra ammunition. Now get a move on and fill those bags. This shit's funding all the fun and games. So, what is the deal with Nemesis? Well, in the first book, Nemesis, it was explained, would often choose a target in a country somewhere around the world. And usually that target would be some sort of world-renowned police officer. And Nemesis would then move to that country or city that that officer worked in, and he would pull off various crimes, tormenting the police department with their inability to catch him. And then Nemesis would usually kill or embarrass the police officer, usually in some sort of convoluted, precise way, showcasing his own brilliance and planning. In this book, Nemesis Reloaded, 
Nemesis's target appears to be a man here in LA named Joe Costello. Joe Costello is an ambitious ex-cop and former district attorney who is tough on crime. He was elected mayor of Los Angeles the prior night with a huge majority and he promised to put 2,000 extra police on the streets. Nemesis at the museum watches the cop cars park outside, readying to respond to his attack here. Nemesis, he's not trying to get away though. No, instead, he is waiting for even more cops to arrive. When Nemesis sees about 15 to 20 cop cars outside, he decides to give it another minute or two. Elsewhere, Joe Costello is giving a victory speech to a crowd of people. His wife, Natalie Costello, is there by his side. While Joe is giving his speech, he invites the chief of police, Wendy Gomez, to the stage to join him so that they can talk about Joe's plans for the city. Wendy Gomez, though, is actually dead. And when she arrives, it is her hanging dangling from a rope tied to her neck high above the stage. Everyone gasps when they see this. We can assume Nemesis was behind this attack on her, too. Back over to Nemesis inside the museum building which is now surrounded by cops. Nemesis, he somehow hacks into various TV screens throughout the city, including one at a local football game. Nemesis, he then addresses the people, he says. Hello, children. Don't worry. There's nothing to be afraid of. If I wanted you dead, you'd be choking on your guts right now. You don't know me, but I've got such a plan for this place, and in seven days' time, everything will be clear. Only one thing stands in the way of my scheme, and it's all these extra cops on the streets. So, I pulled a hundred million dollar heist this evening, the proceeds of which I'm going to share with all the little people. Are you listening out there? Because this is quite an offer. I'm putting a bounty on the head of every police officer in this city. I'll pay you 10 grand for every dead cop. Nemesis says this as he walks into the crowd of cop cars outside, which he seems to have already blown up with various rocket launchers, I assume. And Nemesis, he then executes a cop on that live fee going out to everyone. Nemesis Reloaded, Issue 2 Another senior cop named Reggie Cooper is investigating a crime scene. With Wendy Gomez dead, Reggie Cooper has been made the new acting chief of police by Joe Costello. All the cops in the city respect Joe Costello. He worked his way up from being a simple beat cop all the way to being mayor. Reggie, looking at the crime scene, sees some of his fellow cops that have been murdered by civilians jumping at the chance to make $10,000 from Nemesis's offer. Reggie asks, is this another ambush? A fellow cop answers, fifth one tonight. They got called down here from a domestic disturbance call and then they were trapped by the boys in the alley. Witnesses say that they were only school kids. Reggie, disgusted, says, It's happening all over town. He's paying them for every badge they hand in. No wonder the guys are all packing up and going home. Across town in the museum that Nemesis robbed earlier, we see that Nemesis replaced one of the diamond necklaces with human feces. Joe Costello is there inspecting the robbery, along with rich businessman Fabrice Dubois. This collection that was stolen belonged to Mr. Dubois's family. Thus, he is livid. Mr. Dubois comments, Jesus, bad enough he steals our blue devil of Golconda without taking a dump in the display case too? Joe Costello replies, on the plus side, this means we can do a DNA analysis on his stool. Fabrice Dubois tells Joe Costello, we didn't back your political campaign so some maniac could steal our private collection of African curiosities. Me and my associates 
put you in the mayor's office because we were told you were a man of action. Joe tells Fabrice, the voters are who put me in office, sir. My first responsibility is to them over any rich donors. We're also doing what we can to track this guy down, but this bounty on every police officer has created a serious manpower issue for us. Joe warns Fabrice Dubois that it is probably best he leave town. We know you are already one of his targets, and we don't know if this is anything personal. Fabrice replies, Ha! Fabrice Dubois doesn't scare easily, and I refuse to be spooked by some Nancy boy in a Halloween costume. As soon as Fabrice goes to leave, he is told by one of his people, Sir, we've just been told that your entire estate has been robbed while we've been here. All that's left is some furniture and cushions. They even stole the light fittings. Fabrice can't believe it. Someone then reports into Joe Costello saying, Hey sir, word just came back from the lab. They uh, ran the stool sample through the federal computer and it's a direct match with the first lady. First lady in this case, I'm not sure if that is referring to Joe's wife, the first lady of the new mayor, or the president of the United States, first lady. Joe, upon hearing this, says, Who the hell is this guy? Why is he messing with me like this? Nemesis, he is watching all of this go down from a distance, through some binoculars. One of Nemesis' henchmen, Jake, feels like he shouldn't even be here. Jake explains, There must be a mistake. Everyone here has a criminal background except me and my wife, Margot. We're just retired shopkeepers. Nemesis reassures Jake, you're all part of the plan, Jake. Now, we will get an origin, a newly tweaked origin, on who this nemesis is. Nemesis' real name is Matthew Anderson. His parents were arrested on his 10th birthday for the murder of nine female hitchhikers. These dead hitchhikers were found all over the city of Los Angeles. Eventually, the police found and arrested Matthew's parents, Matthew's mother and father. They were found guilty, and then they were put to death from lethal injection. With Matthew's parents gone, he was then sent into the care system, into situations that were not good. Matthew quickly went out on his own, and he was just living on the streets, picking pockets, and eating out of trash cans. One day at an old school truck stop in San Diego, Matthew tried to pick the pocket of a blonde woman drinking coffee at a booth alone. The woman noticed Matthew trying to steal from her though, and she was not someone to mess with. She told Matthew, Either give me back what you stole from me, or it's back to your horrible children's home, kid. Don't mess with me, boy. You've clearly got a lot of potential and I know a man who can bring that out. But unless you give me back my purse, I'm calling the goddamn cops. Matthew, he returned the purse to the woman. The woman told Matthew, Now, if you want to make some serious coin, I suggest you meet the man I work for. He doesn't extend a lot of invitations, and believe me, he only asks once. Matthew is interested in meeting this mysterious man. The woman gives Matthew a drink and tells him to drink it. When Matthew does, he passes out. And when he wakes up, he appears to be in a cemetery and he was semi-buried alive. He hears the sound of jungle drums getting louder and louder. And then he fully wakes up. And when he wakes up, he is surrounded by people in robes. A man who appears to be the leader of this group addresses Matthew. He tells him, You're in the circle now, and if you dare to leave, my friends will set the dogs on you. Matthew asks, Did you guys just bury me alive? The leader of this circle group responds, Only for your symbolic rebirth. The old you is dead, forever. The new one only dies if you lose. What we're offering is truly special, but you'll have to fight to prove that you deserve it. The other contender is equally worthy. The prize goes to whoever survives. So Matthew, 
he is going to have to fight this other little boy here to the death. Matthew refuses, but when the other boy attacks Matthew with a spear and stabs him, Matthew is forced to defend himself and fight back. After some back and forth and a few close calls, Matthew stabs and kills the other little boy, winning the fight. The leader of the circle then tells Matthew, good job. They then blow dart Matthew and knock him out once again. The leader then tells his men, prepare the boy for the next trial. The next trial was in Yosemite Falls, and the challenge was for Matthew to hold on for three days without losing his grip, while this waterfall was pouring down on him. The leader asked Matthew, what motivates him? Why does he continue to survive? Matthew explains, revenge. Matthew, he wants to get revenge on the police that arrested his parents and eventually led to their deaths. The leader of this circle group replies, what if I said your mother and father were just a couple of junky scumbags? Matthew replies, they were still my mother and father. They taught me everything I ever knew. The master of this group tells Matthew, those cops are really rising through the ranks, especially Joe Costello. I hear he's tipped for very big things. Matthew, he yells, never. I'll kill him before I let them happen. The leader then knocks Matthew off the cliff, and as Matthew is falling, he tells him to prove it. The rest of Nemesis's origin will be continued later. For now, we jump back to the current day. In downtown LA, acting chief of police Reggie Cooper is in a helicopter with Mayor Joe Costello. They are flying above the city, looking at all the destruction and fires down below. Nemesis then strikes at the helicopter. Nemesis is driving an all-white car because of course he has to coordinate his car with his outfit. So this all-white car goes off a ramp and it is soaring in the air. Nemesis then jumps from the car, soars through the helicopter window, breaking the glass. He manages to grab Reggie Cooper and breaks through the glass window on the other side of the helicopter and starts hurtling towards the ground with Reggie Cooper in his arms. Nemesis Reloaded, Issue 3. Nemesis swings down into an office building with Reggie Cooper. In the helicopter, Joe Costello radios in for backup, saying, We just lost the chief of police. Later on, we see Fabrice Dubois is in the back of his car being driven around. He calls Joe Costello. Fabrice is yelling at Joe and says, My friends and I are getting out of Los Angeles, and we're not coming back until you're removed from office. I'm embarrassed we backed your political campaign. Two dead police chiefs in 24 hours? Not to mention what's been stolen from me. Hundreds of millions of dollars worth of valuables. When the call is over, Joe is upset. These were his cop friends that died these last few days, and he doesn't need reminding of how shitty the situation is they are in. Joe radios in to another cop named Eddie Ramirez. Eddie Ramirez is on a police boat. They are checking out a distress call. Out in the water, handcuffed to a buoy, Eddie spots Reggie Cooper. Reggie tells them, Get away, Eddie. It's a trap. He's just using me to get on your boat. Nemesis then gets on the boat and tranquilizes some of the other cops. Eddie pulls out his gun and is aiming it at Nemesis. Nemesis just taunts him though, saying, Just take a second to compose yourself, Eddie, and get used to the rhythm of the boat in the water. You ready now? Good. Now, I want you to hold that gun as steady as you can. Aim right between my shoulder blades. Now, pull the trigger. Eddie asks nervously, Why are you doing this? Nemesis replies, I want you to see how fast I am. Nemesis, he then does a quick motion and he whips around and throws a baton at Eddie. And Eddie, he manages to get a shot off, but he is not quick enough and he misses. And the baton smacks Eddie right in the face and he goes down. 
Nemesis then handcuffs Eddie and Reggie to the inside of the boat, and he wakes them up. The boat is slowly sinking. Nemesis tells them, Now, we haven't got a lot of time here, so I'll get to the point. Do you know who I am? Eddie says, Of course not. Nemesis replies, Well, think about it, because your actions caused the death of my parents, and that's not exactly something a boy forgets. I'm Matthew Anderson, 10 years old, son of Chuck and Katie Anderson, killed for the murder of nine hitchhikers. They might have just been junkies to you, but they were all I had, and you took them from me. Last issue, during the origin flashback of Nemesis, we saw some cops that worked together to arrest Nemesis's parents and solved the crime of the dead hitchhikers. Those cops there are the same ones that Nemesis is torturing and killing now today in Los Angeles. They are Eddie Ramirez, Reggie Cooper, Wendy Gomez, Joe Costello, and a woman we haven't met yet named Maggie Chang. On the boat now, Eddie, he remembers that case, and he tells Nemesis, I'm sorry. Nemesis replies, You know something weird? I really believe you are. I want you to think about my parents as you sink to the bottom of this harbor. Who knows? Maybe they'll be waiting for you on the other side, and you can apologize to them in person. Now, if you'll excuse me, that's my ride arriving. Another boat comes to pick Nemesis up, as Reggie and Eddie drown and sink to the bottom of the ocean floor in their boat. As Nemesis is getting his boat ride back to shore, he tells his people to cut the power to the entire city. Let's see how Los Angeles copes with the little darkness in their lives. We now continue the flashback to Nemesis's origin. He had to continue these trials with this weird circle organization. In one trial, he had to crawl to the bottom of the darkest pit. It took him three days. At the bottom of that pit was the master or leader of the circle. He was there holding a book for Matthew. The book contained, supposedly, the world's greatest secret. The book was titled, A White House in Crisis, President Edward Gerald Marshall. The master of the circle told Matthew to read the book. He told him, This book can never leave this chamber, so you only have as long as it takes this candle to burn down to read it. Matthew asked, What's the book about? The leader replied, It's the memoirs of the president between Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan, the commander-in-chief America forgot. The answer to life's biggest mystery can be found in these pages, and the double mystery of what the book even is. The key inside the book will show you everything in time, but there's a long way to go before you open the secret door. In the meantime, we have your training to continue, and this book to memorize for future reflection. It will take years to understand all of the hidden meanings. Matthew asked, How does the world forget a president? The leader replied, That's the riddle you must solve, boy. Back to the current day. LA is under anarchy with no power. People are murdering and looting in the street. The National Guard finally arrived with Humvees and tanks and other vehicles. But Nemesis, he planned for this too. He planned all of this for 20 years. Nemesis has a suicide bomber flying a commercial airplane in the sky, and that airplane is now heading to this location to fly into all of the National Guard troops that are in the city. How did Nemesis get someone willing to sacrifice their life to fly a plane into the National Guard? Well, Mark Miller has a very cringy, stupid as hell explanation for how Nemesis pulled this off. This part, I think, is really dumb, but let's go with the explanation. So you see this beautiful woman here, her name is Carrie, and she is actually an airline pilot. And this guy here is a, apparently a very mature looking 17 year old boy. Supposedly he seduced her and they went back to this hotel. 
and Nemesis secretly filmed it all going down. And because this guy was 17 and technically a minor, Carrie was then blackmailed. She could lose her job, her marriage, and likely go to jail if this ever got out. And because she was susceptible to blackmail, Nemesis forced her to do things. First, he forced her to make a pornographic video, and then they just double blackmailed her with that new video. And then they forced her to kill a local bad guy, and they then forced her to kill a local good man in order to keep a lid on all of the growing secrets they were forcing her to do, and subsequently further blackmailing her with. So, with a kind of quadruple blackmailing of all these things, Nemesis finally told Carrie that on one of her customer flights, she is to crash the plane into the National Guard here. And if she did that, she would die, of course, but they would keep all of her secrets secret. Carrie, she did what she was told, and she flies that plane right into the National Guard, causing a huge explosion. Nemesis then, with all of his henchmen, starts running, and they begin causing even more havoc. Nemesis Reloaded, Issue 4 Nemesis goes to visit Maggie Chang. Maggie is one of the other cops responsible for putting away Nemesis' parents. Maggie is wheelchair-bound now, after a junkie shot her on the job years back. Maggie is drinking and is bitter how her life turned out. She deduces who Nemesis is. She asks him, You're that little Anderson boy, aren't you? Nemesis says, yes, he is. Maggie replies, I always had a feeling you'd come back to get us after we busted your mother and father. I've seen you coming in my dreams for a while. I'd probably do the same in your position. The two of them then chat about the poor state of the world and America. Maggie asks Nemesis if he can make it quick, her death. Nemesis tells her, to be honest, Maggie, I already killed you. We laced your vodka with a derivative of the lethal injection the doctors used when they executed my parents. The rest of your body will be useless as your legs soon. I doubt you'll be able to blink in a moment. Nemesis tells Maggie that his henchmen here, Jake and Margot, are going to light this apartment on fire, and Maggie will burn in that chair, too paralyzed to scream. Just like his parents felt when their bodies were tranquilized and the poison hit their hearts with the lethal injection. Jake the henchman says that he's not sure he can do this. Nemesis threatens to blow Jake's head off as Jake has a bomb strapped around his neck. Jake asks, why are you doing this? Why the hell are you torturing two innocent people? Jake is referring to himself and his wife, Margot. Nemesis dismisses Jake and tells him, do you really want to do this here? finish the job. Nemesis, he then phones Joe Costello, who is being driven in a police cruiser at the time. Nemesis tells Joe, you might want to turn that car around, Mr. Mayor, because Maggie Chang is going to burn to death if you don't get to her apartment in time. You remember Maggie Chang, don't you? She's one of your old police buddies you stepped over on your way to City Hall. Joe, he does get that cruiser to turn around, and it speeds as fast as it can to Maggie's apartment. But he is too late. As Joe begins running into the apartment, the place blows up in flames, and Joe gets blown back and lands on the ground. Nemesis then comes out of the burning building. He shoots the other cops that Joe has with him. Nemesis then grabs Joe's gun and shoots Joe in the knee with it. Nemesis tells Joe... You don't die till Friday, Mr. Mayor. Nemesis then walks away. Later on, we see Nemesis atop a building, looking down at the city below. I found this interesting. Nemesis is looking at some advertisements for the failed Jupiter's Legacy TV show, which was based on one of Miller's other books. Later on, Joe Costello is in the hospital for the shot to his knee. Him and the other cops there are trying to come up with some theories on what Nemesis's motivations are. Joe, he then looks around and asks, Why are the lights on? Why was the power to the city restored? Nemesis must have purposely restored the power for a reason. 
He wants to send a message of some sort. Sure enough, Joe is right. Nemesis is on TV, and he has a message playing on a continuous loop. Nemesis in the message says, Good morning, Los Angeles. Welcome to more chaos and disorder. But this will seem like the good old days compared to what I've got coming next. The device behind me is an atomic bomb. And the bad news is I'm going to level this city if anyone is seen in public. I've got drones in the sky watching every single street. So it's locked down again until further notice. But this could all end tomorrow if the mayor plays ball and does precisely as I tell him. I know he's recovering in the hospital from those gunshot wounds, but he can make everything right again if he meets me on the 5 p.m. train at the Pershing Square subway. Oh, and make sure you're on your own, Joe. One wrong move and I press this red button here. That is the end of the message. Joe sits up and he is prepared to meet Nemesis and follow through on his demands. The others in the room say that Nemesis will kill him for sure. Joe understands that, but he has a feeling if he at least gives himself up, all of this will at least stop and no one else will get hurt. Joe's wife, Natalie, arrives in the hospital and talks with her husband. Joe asks if their son, Killian, is still staying with Natalie's sister. She answers, yeah, but I couldn't stay there when I heard what happened to you. Look what he's done, oh honey. Your poor legs. Are you really going to catch this train? Joe says, I have to. He'll set off a nuclear bomb if I don't. That afternoon, with the entire city staying indoors per Nemesis's orders, Joe heads off to catch that 5 p.m. train that Nemesis wants him on. Joe, he arrives at the station and gets on the train and he heads off. Joe's whole journey here is being live-streamed to the world by Nemesis. The entire city and Joe's wife Natalie are all watching the stream on their TV and other devices. As the train is on the tracks moving, it eventually approaches a tunnel. Once it hits the tunnel, the train goes dark. When the train comes out to the other side of the tunnel, Joe is no longer on it. Everyone watching from home has no idea what happened to Joe. Nemesis has Joe tied to the nuclear bomb in his lair. He tells Joe, Hello, Mr. Mayor. This is the bomb I was telling you about. Are you ready to answer some difficult questions? Because the entire city is depending on you right now. We have a flashback now to Nemesis's mission for this mysterious circle group. Nemesis is riding a white horse to a castle in Eastern Europe called the Castle of Reflection. Nemesis, he narrates as he is riding the horse, One more test, and I'm done. One more rite of passage. Break into the castle, murder the owner, steal what she has in her vault for my master. The answer to everything lies inside, but I've already figured out what's going on here. I know what happened to America's lost president. I've already cracked the world's darkest secret. Nemesis Reloaded, Issue 5 Still in the flashback, Nemesis is killing his way into the castle, murdering many guards. The owner of the castle is a woman named Black Lotus. She is some sort of supervillain with powers. She is warned of Nemesis' intrusion. She says that she will see him in her mirrors. Leaving that for now, we jump back to the current day in Los Angeles. Joe Costello is rigged to a nuclear bomb and a lie detector. Nemesis tells him that the lie detector is very sophisticated, so he better not lie because if he lies, the bomb will blow. The whole interrogation is being broadcast to everyone in Los Angeles. Nemesis' first question is... Are you the former detective and heroic district attorney known as Honest Joe Costello? Joe answers, yes. Nemesis asks, and are you the current mayor of Los Angeles? Joe says, he is. So far, these are all softball questions. Nemesis tries to throw Joe off. He asks, how big is your penis? 
Joe thinks on it for a bit and Nemesis prods him to answer. Joe says, shut up, shut up. I'm just, I'm trying to think. Um, eight inches erect, five flaccid, 5.4 girth. Across all of these questions, the lie detector says that Joe is being truthful. Finally, Nemesis asks the real question that he wants an answer to. He says, I want you now to tell me everything concerning the arrests of Chuck and Katie Anderson for the murder of those nine hitchhikers all those years ago. These people are Nemesis's parents. Joe, being forced to tell the truth, explains that him and his fellow officers, the ones that Nemesis murdered this week, they all came through the academy together and they vowed to shake things up, to clean up the city. And they solved all of these crimes, big and small, one by one, together. But there was one case they couldn't crack. Who was murdering all of those hitchhikers? Eventually, after failing to figure it out, they decided to set someone up and pin the murder on them. And Nemesis's parents were chosen. Joe says, We'd been after a couple of drug dealers for a while, a husband and wife, and we couldn't pin anything on them. They were making a killing and driving us nuts because we'd taken down everyone else in that area. I don't remember who had the idea, but we decided to kill two birds with one stone and frame these guys for the murder of the hitchhikers, giving ourselves a perfect record and continuing our rise through the ranks of the department. We, we faked the evidence for Chuck and Katie Anderson and sent them both to prison for a crime they didn't commit. Nemesis says, but you didn't just send them to prison, did you? You knew they faced death by lethal injection, leaving their little boy behind in the care system. Do you know who that boy grew up to be? Joe realizes that Nemesis was that boy. Nemesis continues, You always had to be the best, didn't you? You always had to win, no matter what the cost, to anyone else. Your family must feel sick about your behavior. Nemesis then turns off the nuclear bomb and has the video feed cut. Nemesis then has his parents' coffin, with his dead parents inside, brought up and presented to Joe. We now go back to the flashback to the castle. Nemesis is still killing his way through everyone, and finally he is face to face with Black Lotus. Lotus tells Nemesis, You're not the first he sent to kill me, and you certainly won't be the last. You can see all the weapons I took from the other would-be assassins. He wants what's upstairs, but there's only one way to get it. Through her, Black Lotus then disappears into a mirror. Nemesis tries firing his freeze gun at her. He is missing, though, as Black Lotus is zipping in and out of all of these various mirrors in the room, almost as if they are portals. At one point, there appears to be multiple of her in the room. She definitely has some sort of powers of some sort. She kicks and punches Nemesis back. He goes flying into a mirror, shattering it. Lotus appears to have the upper hand. She taunts, saying, I'm tired of playing with you. I heard you were the best your master ever trained, but you're no better than the others. You don't even have a gadget for me to keep. Multiple of her then grab on to Nemesis and start trying to pull him into a mirror. Nemesis is aiming the freeze gun, trying to shoot at something. She asks him, Where are you aiming the freeze gun, you fool? I'm over here. Nemesis sees her reflection in some cracked pieces of mirror on the ground, and he replies, Actually, you're everywhere. He blasts the freeze gun and it sprays all over the place, bouncing off of the various mirrors, and somehow it freezes Black Lotus. She tells him, Very clever. Nemesis, with his sword, then decapitates her. Jumping back to the current day again. Two of the henchmen Nemesis hired, Jake and Margot, are driving Nemesis to the airport. They ask him what he ended up doing with Joe Costello. Nemesis explains he buried Joe Costello in the coffin with his parents and put him under the floor of City Hall, where no one will ever hear him. Joe always said he would be at City Hall for a long time. He didn't know how right he was. What about all of those other henchmen the Nemesis hired? Well, 
Nemesis fulfilled his promise to them. They were allowed to go back to running their old gangs. They would now be the leader of those gangs as Nemesis disposed of their bosses. And what about Fabrice Dubois, the rich socialite? It turns out he was actually just Nemesis himself, merely an alter ego he constructed for this ruse. And he will also collect the insurance money for all the goods that Nemesis stole from himself Fabrice Dubois earlier. As Jake and Margot arrive at the airport, and Nemesis begins to head to his private plane, Margot, she comments, So it's all tied up perfectly, Mr. Anderson. Every loose end and a little bow now, eh? Nemesis to this replies, Well, except for one thing. Who really killed all of those hitchhikers 20 years ago? Who stood back and let my parents take the blame for their crimes? It turns out that Jake and Margot were responsible for that. Nemesis tells them, Did you really think you were going to get away with this, Jake? I know what you and Margot used to get up to. Nemesis gives both of them a gun and tells them, Alright, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna settle this with an old-fashioned duel, and whoever draws first gets to be my butler. I've got a whole list of criminal ventures planned for the future, and I need to have someone to make my morning coffee. What do you say? Does that sound like a fair way of settling this? Margot immediately shoots and kills her husband, Jake. She explains it was him or me boss, and sure as hell wasn't going to be me. Nemesis hands her his bag and tells her, You know, I think you and I are going to get along just fine. Back to the flashback now, and finally getting the answers to the questions. Nemesis killed Black Lotus in her castle. His master and the leader of the circle then joined Nemesis. Nemesis used Lotus's decapitated head and held it up to a retina scanner she had there in her castle that led into a secret room that had this object that Nemesis's master wanted. The leader of this circle group told Nemesis, Well done, Matthew. I always hated that bitch and her territory can now be yours as a reward, but a question before you step inside. Have you figured out the mystery of the forgotten president? Do you know why the world has no memory of this individual? Nemesis then explains the great mystery. The president's name was Ernest George Marshall. He was elected in 1980, and Ronald Reagan was his vice president. He had a brief, tumultuous time in office starting with the Iranian hostage crisis and ending with three alien fugitives invading the White House. He wrote the memoirs after he resigned on health grounds, and it's the only known record of both this man and how the world used to be. The world back then used to be populated with superheroes, skies constantly filled with them, flying around, crazy events happening everywhere, but, in 1986, the supervillains got together and beat all of the heroes once and for all and took over the world, and they made everyone in the world forget that superheroes ever existed, and now people only remember superheroes in their dreams and as works of fiction. And we see this particular image here. Some of you may not recognize the significance of this image who these people are, or this plotline of supervillains beating these superheroes and taking over the world, but I do, and I have to admit I was pretty excited when I realized that Nemesis was going to be directly tying into Mark Miller's other book from 2005 called Wanted. Wanted is another book which I've covered here on my channel, and I recommend checking it out. In Wanted, the supervillains killed all of the heroes in a great battle, and they secretly ruled the world afterwards and split it up amongst themselves, and they made everyone else in the world forget that superheroes ever existed. Well, now it appears Nemesis supposedly takes place in that same universe. And in this image, we see various characters from Wanted. There is the Fox, 
Mr. Rictus, and Professor Solomon Seltzer. As Nemesis and this master of this circle group enter this room, the master says, Do you know what's in this room, Matthew? Do you know what I sent you to retrieve? A trophy from the great battle. The only proof the big guy ever lived. In the room, they are looking at a red cape, which I assume belongs to the Utopian, a.k.a. Sheldon Sampson, who is from another Mark Miller book called Jupiter's Legacy. The Utopian is essentially sort of like Superman. I have also covered Jupiter's Legacy on my channel, so check out those videos if you are interested. The master of this circle group then removes his mask and finally reveals himself. This man is Wesley Gibson, who is the main character from Wanted. Wesley says to Nemesis, My name is Wesley Gibson, and I was just a nobody until I found out my father was one of the people who made all this happen. Now, I'm one of the world's secret masters, and I'm offering you a chance to join us. We've got plans for the human race, and we need a man with your appetite for death and destruction. Are you interested? Nemesis says he is, and Wesley replies, Good. Welcome to the Fraternity. The Fraternity is the name of their secret supervillain organization that rules the world. A whole bunch of supervillains then pile into the room. And this is how Nemesis Reloaded ends. The book then teases a Miller World crossover event that will supposedly be tying into all of these other books that Mark Miller wrote. And the name of this crossover event book will be called Big Game. So it will be interesting to see how all of this stuff will tie together in the future. All right, so that was Nemesis Reloaded. What did I think of this book? So, as I was going through the book, I thought it was only okay. This whole Joe Costello and the cops thing and Nemesis just pwning everybody and being a bad guy and killing everyone. It was very typical Nemesis. And then we had kind of some weird changes to the origin with this president the world forgot and this secret organization, the Circle, that was somehow training Nemesis from a little kid and indoctrinating him. So I thought that was all kind of interesting, although I did not really know where it was going to go. And I think heading into the final issue, Nemesis Reloaded was kind of like a six six and a half out of ten kind of book for me. But then in the final issue, when it was revealed that Nemesis Reloaded was tying back into Wanted, I gotta be honest, it kind of blew my mind a little bit. Now, if you've never read Wanted, you will not understand the impact of that, and it would have gone over your head, and, you know, that would not have much weight with you. But I'm very familiar with Wanted, and like I said, it blew my mind. You know, Wanted came out in 2005. And now in 2023, after not talking about Wanted in all that time, he's tying it back in with that? I thought that was a really cool twist. I love it, man. It reminds me of M. Night Shyamalan in the 2017 movie Split, how it secretly tied back in with the 2000 movie of his, Unbreakable. And I kind of lost my mind when that happened. And uh, yeah, so I thought that was really cool. And then when Wesley Gibson showed up and we saw some of the other wanted characters, oh man, I was on board. I thought that was really awesome. So it really elevated the book for me. And I'm pretty excited to see uh, where they go from here. And is Miller really going to connect Nemesis and Wanted to his entire uh, line of books? Like, are we really going to tie in with Kick-Ass? And Empress and Jupiter's Legacy and Super Crooks and Starlight. Is he really going to tie in with all those? I'm very curious to see how he's going to do it. So, uh, yeah, very cool stuff. Now, Nemesis Reloaded is still not an amazing book, but the twist and tying back into Wanted raises it to a 7 out of 10 for me. So, uh, yeah, those are my thoughts on this book. Let me know yours in the comments, and I will see you all again in the future.